Daniel Cormier, more like fuck you. Welcome back to the spite site. <laughs> I have been waiting for this day. <laughs> oh man, I've been so excited. I've been thinking about it. Uh, it's been the talk of the town. How exactly is Danny going to bury DC's legacy on the podcast? Well, here it is, folks. We got an hour ahead of us. We're we're already starting ahead of schedule. We are about to dive in, and I am going to personally, relentlessly demonstrate exactly how much I hate Daniel Cormier and how he's been permanently kicked out of any greatest of all time discussion. We're starting with a gauntlet throw. Welcome back, everybody. <laughs> how was that? Was that... <laughs> Did I set the tone? That was amazing. I mean, I'm not used to being the moderate here, but I do have to ask when Cormier was ever in the greatest of all time discussions. That's right. That's <laughs> that's right. Say, it's not even just me, folks. Hax, you there? So, for those of you who don't have pictures of, like, Danny's family and everything on your Twitter feed, he has decorated his entire fucking apartment and house with Croatian flags. And, like, you, know, you have no idea how happy he is that you know, she just, just beat DC on the weekend. Like, holy crap. I've never seen somebody sell out their, uh, you know, their, their love so quick. If it was socially acceptable, he'd wrap himself in a Croatian flag and go out in public. I am currently in talks with my professors at Academy to see if I can spray paint my fire turnout gear in the Croatian flag colors. <laughs> I'll keep you posted on that. That would look good. Um, no, it wouldn't. I would light on fire. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, welcome back to the Fight Site MMA podcast. What a cold open. Um, this week, we are... Uh, there is a very shitty card on Saturday. God, I feel like we say that way too often. Um, but we are not going to focus on it. We are instead going to focus on... UFC 252, I was wrong about which card I thought it was last week. 252, uh, with our good friend Hacks Arised, and we are going to break down uh, Stipe versus DC3, the end of the trilogy that no one asked for, and uh, I mean, there's a couple other interesting things on that card, but mostly we're just going to talk about the, uh, the legacy of Black Fedor. Fedor Emelianegro, uh, as someone on Reddit put it, which I don't know how I feel about. Um, first of all, I want to say this was a uh, not a great fight. Not even a really a, a great performance from Stipe. But it was definitive, and I think that's a good place to start. I'm going to pitch it to Hacks. Uh because he's usually a little bit more measured with his criticism than I. What do you mean? This was an amazing fight. This was the best fight ever. This is the fight I'll be happy about all year. I'm, I'm so happy, you know. Um, there's a phrase that gets run around in our chat lately, which is, um, it's better to, it, it, sorry, it's it's easier to be great than good. And um, I will start the discussion by throwing that out there. But for me, this was. A fight that managed to be rather mediocre in terms of the technical standards and rather legendary in terms of the uh, meaning of the fight, if you want to shape it that way. Um, we all predicted an ugly fight. We all predicted the uglier it would get, the more it would favor DC. Um, and uh, Serum and I both went, well, you know, if this fight is going to be a win in the in, in the scorecards or in the finish for me Miocic uh, body shots are going to have to be a critical part of that and then Miocic walked out and proceeded to prove all of us wrong uh he didn't just give a fuck you to the DC fans he gave a fuck you to everybody it was like can you stop being dumb and fight properly for once uh I kind of want to hear what the two of you actually have to say about that so I'll, I'll end my tirade there and get on with it But I think, sorry for that. I think just as a no, general, you're fine. Rule, I was waiting for I was waiting for Spiram to talk. <laughs> uh, I would just add one more thing that um, 
Oh man, Dan at typewriting DA is going to be so happy about this fight. <laughs> I think he's going to be the happiest person <laughs> in the entire fandom at this stage. I thought I'd mention that because he'll feel underappreciated if we don't. Yeah, I mean, I think that's. I think Stipe. It was very weird because we expected the body shots to kind of turn into a win at some point because Cormier's body shot thing was probably not going to get better at this stage. But Stipe fought it like he had a limited number of body shots in the tank and he just got them all out early this time, which was uh, disheartening if we expected Stipe to do very, very well this time. But yeah, I think Stipe kind of committed himself to like commanding this fight because he knew that if it got really, really ugly, it wouldn't necessarily favor him. So it was, you know... Uh, Stipe just controlling him in the clinch later in the fight as DC Gas, not really gunning for a finish as hard as he did, uh, as hard as he could have after he like nearly killed DC at the end of round two. But I mean, I think this was just, you know, this was the Stipe that we've seen before in a little bit more conservative of a fight than we expected. Yeah. Um, I thought that Stipe had the right approach from the beginning. He was jabbing. He threw some nice left hooks to the body. To his credit, DC also threw some left hooks to the body. And uh, it looked like Stipe kind of wanted to get his body shots out of the way early. You know, just knock them out. It's like he has to he has to read daily. So he decided to knock it out early, and then he wouldn't even have to think about it. Um, there were some parentheticals to this fight that I find very strange. Number one how easily Stipe got the better of DC in the clinch with little more than just wrist control, like an underhook and wrist control. I think we can obviously look at DC's physical erosion, <clears throat> strength, endurance, but Ryan had an interesting read that like if, if DC's clinch can be nullified that easily, it's kind of worth wondering if his clinch was ever that much to begin with. I thought, I mean, it was clear that DC had, uh, or sorry, Stipe had the biggest moment at the end of the second round where he almost knocked DC silly, and he was very, very close to getting a knockout, which was nice. It was clear that I don't think either man could really keep the pace that they really wanted. They both looked pretty ragged by the end of it. It, it was a very strange fight to end the trilogy on. Like, in some ways, the second fight was at least definitive. And it, it told us some things about who these people are. Uh, and I thought that this fight is without meaning, more just that it just was an, it was a strange one. It just doesn't, like, I, there aren't a whole lot of, like, individual technical things that were done in this fight that really counted for a lot. It was more just, like, how impotent DC became. Uh, Serum and I have mentioned many times on Twitter that... DC cannot, he has not won a fight that has gone past round two since 2016. When Serum and I were talking about the second fight a couple months ago, he brought that up to my attention, and uh, I've thought about it ever since. And it's true, after the second round, I was very skeptical if DC was going to do anything after that point, especially after getting hurt pretty badly. Uh, he did end up having more, he did more than I expected him to, but it still wasn't enough. But hacks, hacks. You have some, you have some interesting, broader takeaways from this fight, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you say them because they really got me reconsidering how I saw this fight and how I see DC as a fighter. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you, you say your piece. My, my first thought when I kind of walked away from this fight was good. DC lost. Um, the second thought was. <sighs> I don't want to pretend this was a similar fight on the technical level of the skill sets of the fighters, but something kept sticking in my head, which was this This felt to me like Usman versus um, Covington in the sense that it almost felt like um, Miocic fought a fight that was designed as much as possible to be in DC's wheelhouse in certain ways. Like, he was much, much more willing to you know, trade straight blows to trade clinch exchanges. Uh, he even at some points tried to use his wrestling to create opportunities to come over the top with striking. Um, and as I, as I kind of said to you guys, um, DC's entire career has been, I have these tremendous athletic advantages. Um, 
I have a game plan which is built around delivering them to the enemy. He's a huge athletic battering ram, I think was the um was the way I framed it. And every time I think of a DC fight, his even though he has refined and he and I do think he has improved in various ways throughout his career, DC's game plan has always been the same thing. Smash on the door until it gives away. Take the fortress. And he's twenty two for three. He's only ever lost to two fighters, John Jones and 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 you know Miocic. If you look at the Jones fights, um, Jones attacked his vulnerabilities at every single point in both fights. That's what Jones did was this successful. He um he controlled as we I think now can reflect DC's more limited ability in the clinch with just basic risk control. To be brutally honest, uh, he relentlessly attacked DC's body. He you know really abused the fact that DC doesn't look particularly uh, dangerous unless it's transitions out of the clinch with striking because a lot of his movement is just walking at you. Like he, DC has never really had a great grasp on lateral movement. So Jones was constantly attacking vulnerabilities in the first fight, sapping DC's tank, and then in the second fight, he was able to manufacture a fight-winning situation out of DC's tendencies. You know, kick, you know, kicks him in the head, brings his hands down. We've been through this a million times. But then we go to the, the Miocic fights, and DC uh, knocks Miocic out by doing a good job of attacking vulnerabilities in the first fight. To what degree Miocic's chin was compromised or his eyesight was compromised is a discussion that was probably best left out of the podcast or will be here for hours. But I think we can all agree that even if DC wouldn't have knocked Miocic out with that strike, he would have gotten a lot more right hands off in the clinch. He did over the trilogy. And in the second fight, DC was having his fight until Miocic found the body shots, put him down. But in this third fight, it wasn't like that. Miocic mean, didn't really beat DC by consciously attacking his vulnerabilities. He stood man-to-man with him. A fair criticism of Miocic in the chat was he was often literally standing in front of DC and not looking to disengage where he had the time, where he had the energy, where he had the patience. Um, he Most of his work was done through straight blows against DC's mummy guard. Uh, a lot of stubby low kicks from both men. Uh, Miocic was still getting out jabbed because of a hand speed differential he didn't seem prepared to address and yet Miocic won he had more effective striking he had more effective work in the clinch and the wrestling was kind of a wash from both guys this is DC's fight this is the fight that DC builds his entire identity on I am the grinder man and I will outgrind you because I am the hard working man and I can't be beaten and I have a chin that you can't fold and Miocic was like, yeah, okay, fuck you. I'll beat you. And he did. And I'm looking at the fight thinking, well, what do I think of DC now? This is probably the first time in DC's entire career he's gotten the fight he wanted against the top-level opponent king at the division that he said he wanted, and he lost. This was probably DC's best fight he was ever going to have, to beat somebody who was indisputably in the top... 20 or 30 fighters of all time in terms of legacy and he lost so i've walked away from this fight with a lower appreciation of where dc was relative to a week ago i like that um and i don't just like it because i hate dc um that is the kind of point that makes me made me rethink it too is that i don't that's the thing is you can look at a lot of the different things that Stipe did across these three fights. And it's interesting because it's like, there are, there are trends like it, it, the fight, the three fights sort of trend in such a way that's almost antithetical to the arc that Jones had where, you know, DC has this early success gradually, uh, Stipe starts figuring out, puts him away, and then over the 25-minute fight, like, that's where that's where DC's working in all these phases that should be where he's comfortable, where he's best. And I mean, like, if there was something wrong with my analysis in the pre-fight, it was that I said, you know, DC might be better at winning ugly, but I obviously that proved to be untrue. I can't say that anymore. Um, and it was... It was encouraging for me to see Miocic beat DC this way because, as we've said many times before, DC does not 
appear to be the kind of fighter who has ever critically reevaluated his own game. He's never taken a look at his strengths and weaknesses. He's never come across a problem that he didn't think he could just force his way through. And to see that entire context come crumbling down and, you know, and come crumbling down thoroughly across two fights against someone who is also, you know, not his athletic equal, um, was brilliant. Like, I, I love that. Like, that is, that is what I love about this sport. I mean, it didn't make the fight any more fun to watch necessarily, but it's, you know, it, it, Stipe's, you know, he's showing qualities that DC always acted like weren't important. And earlier today, Hacks, I actually was listening to your segment on the fir- on the podcast we did last week, where you said that if Stipe wins the second fight and then subsequently the third fight, uh, it is something of a rebuttal to DC's greatness or DC's claim to greatness. And I think that proved to be true. Like, I think that absolutely proved to be true. I can't, I, I can't have a lot of respect for DC as a fighter if that's the way he sees the problems in front of him. I think, honestly, some of some of what DC said after the second fight probably should have cued me into this analysis more, where he said, you know, oh, I, I, I just fumbled it. Like, I got overconfident. Like, it was a, he, he made it sound like it was a rookie mistake that he made against Stipe, and that's why he lost. And it didn't sound like him or anyone from his team had any clue what was actually going on. And I, I give you guys credit for, for picking the fight the way you did in the sense that when you hear that from a camp, it's generally a bad sign. Serum? Yeah, pretty much the same place. I think the, the interesting thing that I noted right after the fight is that the greatest heavyweight trilogy of all time, quote unquote, to determine the greatest heavyweight of all time, quote unquote, we just had a piece run about who the greatest actually is, but there's a claim for the winner of this to be the greatest heavyweight of all time. I think the interesting thing there is that it was decided in such a very prototypically heavyweight fight. And that if you look at the second fight, you had like, oh, a guy made an adjustment and that's not a heavyweight thing to do. But if you look at the third fight, it was two guys trading positions along the fence, kind of doing nothing with it for a lot of the fight. No one seemed to really learn anything overarching. Like, Stipe learned things about DC, but then he either immediately dropped them or they were only applicable to DC. No one really got better. So it was a very heavyweight sort of fight where, as you mentioned, that's the kind of fight where DC does well. Heavyweight fights are where DC's brand of, like, tenacity does really well because you could just bull through guys, where Stipe's strengths have always been, I'm less like a heavyweight than these other guys. So it's a very interesting way to look at it because... Stipe won the heavyweight fight. This was the heavyweight fight, and Stipe won it. There's a there's a point there that actually really connects with um, a com- conversations I've had with the missus because obviously, uh, you know, I, I've done competition, she's done competition. Her competition has been a lot more way set by um, injuries. She she had to quit seriously considering um, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competitions because of her injuries. And she said at, at some point when you start thinking about your legacy, when you start thinking about what does it mean to be a good fighter, you stop fighting for everyone else and you start fighting for yourself. And this was a this was a really important moment for me in kind of framing this fight because I don't think Miocic came out there with a plan to win in the most technical way. And I, and I admit I am theorizing the shit out of it here. Like I will freely admit I'm just fucking throwing stuff out there. But um, a lot of the guys in our chat seemed almost offended by the degree to which Miocic was like, fuck the science, I'm going to beat the shit out of DC. And I completely understand that frustration on almost every level. It's frustrating technically. It's frustrating because a, a fighter is getting punched in the head without it need to. It's frustrating because just about everybody in the chat hates DC and doesn't want DC to get a fight where he has a better chance of winning. But part of me just feels that fight for Miocic was, fuck everybody else. It's not about you. It's about me. This guy has spent his entire career and his entire career that was spent fighting me implying he's the man. I'm not the man. He's the grinder. I'm not the grinder. He's the underdog. I'm not the underdog. Well, fuck him. This I'm going to give him his fight, and I'm going to beat the shit out of him. And nobody, not a single person in the entire world that watches this fight can say DC was a better fighter or DC was a greater fighter for five rounds. He had his one-round knockout. I had my, if you like, one-round turnaround um I don't think I have enough time left in my career or energy to rethink 
but I have enough, you know, I have enough to introduce my fists to his face. And that is really how I feel about this fight. This fight wasn't about anyone for Miocic other than himself. It was a fight for him and his sake. And it's the only way of reading it that makes sense. And yeah, we could just say he's got the big dumb because he's in the heavyweight and he's the big dumb, but that feels cheap, doesn't it? That feels like we're, um, what's the word? That feels like we're running away from an attempt to do some analysis where some interesting analysis could be found. Yeah. I like that analysis a lot. Um, and I, I felt that it was like, this is, I have people asking me all the time. They always ask me like, what, what, why do you hate DC? Like, what about DC? Do you not like everything? But one of the big things, uh, was something that hacks very aptly put, uh, in the in our last discussion, last week's discussion, where he said that the dichotomy between DC as a person and DC as a fighter is a pretty wide one, where DC the person tries to come across as this very, very humble, measured, hardworking individual. He he basically uh, he's Hank Hill more or less, and DC the fighter who is just an athletic monster who built a style around being an athletic monster and never took his opponent seriously because he always knew that he was an athletic monster and he could get bailed out by his athleticism. And that when he's, when he's lost, he tended to get figured out pretty badly. Like it, he tends to, he tends to really get really, really get beaten up quite a bit because he just has no real way to adapt and i think that you can look across these three fights and you can clearly identify which of the two fighters is a is smarter which of them knows how to fight the opponent better which of them has more options which of them can create more options and I think that the, the idea that Stipe fought this fight for no one other than himself really rings true when you consider that, you know, DC, DC, this is DC looks at every opportunity as a, a chance to to tell the world how great he is. He just wants to he, he wants to show everyone how unbelievably special Daniel Cormier is and why he deserves to be in all the history books and is and respected and loved by everyone because that's who he is that's he I mean there was a period in DC's career where he tried to be a little bit more of kind of a funny sort of heel but it just it just fell flat we, we all knew like like Daniel Cormier basically walked into the sport of MMA demanding demanding greatness saying that he was just he deserved greatness from the beginning and so why I relish him losing so much is because I relish the fact that a a fighter who wasn't supposed to beat him, like who wasn't supposed to have as much success as him, who wasn't supposed to beat him out in a trilogy, you know, the one who we, we saw the first fight and we thought, OK, maybe Maybe DC really is that much better. You know, maybe he's just so much faster than all these opponents. He's just no one can compete with him athletically. And then DC really came in with or Stipe came in, had to rethink his approach on the fly. By the end, it was a very different approach and it just washed DC. And then he gave DC his fight over five rounds and still managed to beat him very clearly. Like that to me says a lot about that to me reveals kind of the arrogance of Daniel Cormier as a person. And his his lack of respect for his opponents, it's the kind of thing that has that should have gotten him knocked out many times over in his career and just didn't. And so even if it is at the tail end of his career, I am very happy to see him exposed the way he was. Uh, I do have one more thing to say about DC, but I'm going to I'm going to pitch it to Serum because I'm sure he has some thoughts as well. Yeah, I agree with all that. I think the thing that DC would probably say when you say he's he's a hardworking guy but not a hardworking fighter is that you could look at a lot of his fights, like the Gustafson fight and even like the two Jones fights, where all he did was work hard. Like he walked forward, he was like, oh, I'm going to fight you, R. And like it, it, it didn't work in a lot of times, but a lot of times it did. And that was because of his effort. 
But I think the thing that has to be pointed out with Cormier is that he's not at a hardworking camp in terms of how much they think. He's at a hardworking camp in terms of how much they do. And the fact that Stipe Miocic just outworked him is something that I think Hacks uh, pointed out earlier, but that's still worth mentioning because the way that Stipe Miocic works is that he is a thinking fighter in terms of, uh, in, in the broader context of all heavyweight, is that he can fight in a bunch of different ways. He's He can put in these tiny little adjustments based on what his opponents have done before, and he could win with that. With this one, it was... He had some adjustments, but it was overwhelmingly that kind of fight where DC's like, okay, I am hardworking in terms of not how much how much I think, but how much I do in a fight. And Stipe was like, I'll just do more. And it worked out not as well as I think many of us would have expected, but Stipe had the better moments, first of all, the better game plan going in, even if he abandoned it. And just he just controlled the fight from beginning to end, in my opinion, aside from like a couple moments for DC and, of course, the eye pokes, which uh, probably merit mention, although that's been beaten to death much like Stipe's eye sockets. So uh, Cormier, he's he's an annoying fighter to watch, I think, but he's also just an annoying one to discuss because a lot of what he does seems covered up by just the fact that he's able to work harder than everyone. Like, it's hard to gauge his skill for a lot of people because when you just watch someone win and win and win, it's hard to say he's winning because of his physicality and not because of his skill. When he has all the credentials and he has all these big wins, it's annoying to discuss him. And I think now the discussion's kind of been put to rest when his best win has been avenged twice over. I'd add two important qualifiers. Firstly, I don't think anyone here wants to imply that we don't think DC doesn't work incredibly hard and the dedication and discipline he's shown to becoming a professional fighter isn't deeply something worthy of respect. It's that DC then takes it to the next step and in the way he talks about other fighters implies they're not as great as me because they don't work as hard. That's kind of the dichotomy or the fundamental hypocrisy that I think frustrates everybody here. I think that's important to just reinforce that because I know some people will not listen to this part of the podcast and say that we hate DC anyway. And secondly, I would say the idea of DC wanting to be Hank Hill is incredible because what is Hank Hill known for? What is one of his most famous scenes? I'm going to kick your ass because he doesn't like the other guy and then running across, what is it like a motorway with cars flying across in a race to kick the guy's ass who he said he was going to kick the guy's ass. And if that's not a perfect animated summary of exactly what Miocic did in this fight, then what the fuck is? (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I thought you were about to say something about propane and DC basically being full of hot air, but I like that. I think yours was better. There's something that I have been wanting to say for so long and I've never got the chance. Another reason why I've always hated DC, uh, maybe not hated is, is, I mean, I do hate him, but anyway, I digress. I expected Daniel Cormier's chin to give out long before it did. <laughs> I'm not the only one to have this sentiment, but like, if you go back to, you know, the first John Jones fight, like, you know, DC, it was clear that DC was incredibly tough by that point in his career. And there's no doubt that he was a very tough, durable fighter. Um, even getting beaten up by John Jones for 25 minutes in their first fight, he still he still was never, like, hurt, hurt, I don't think. Then he had the Rumble fight where he got, you know, kind of, tossed or you know knocked around and flopped all over the cage he had that really grueling ugly war with alexander gustafson he even got hurt to the body by anderson silva the second rumble fight and you know jones ironically uh ended up being the one who just scalped him with a head kick and finally put him out um i always 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 expected dc's chin to just give way at some point, like I, I, I kept looking at these fights and I'm being like, he was so close to getting finished by Rumble. Like he was close to getting finished by Gus. He did get finished by Jones. It's like, why is his chin still hanging in there? Like, why is he still able to, to tank these, this unbelievable amount of damage and he doesn't go down. And then it ended up being the body shots for Stipe but they were body shots. He didn't just like, it wasn't just like a perfect right hand that crumpled Cormier. And then there was this fight where it was clear he, he could feel the shots more. He got hurt um, and almost finished at a certain point, but he made it to the decision. There was, I just always, I always expected DC to like, I expected his chin to go at some point and it just never did. And I was always surprised as to why, but in some ways, like, and I, I think what was in my head 
that was always the like what I associated with DC's physical place, if that makes sense. Like, I, like where is his physicality at? And I'm like, well, I think he's a declining athlete, so I think he's going to get knocked out soon. In reality, DC's declining athleticism wound up looking a little bit more like Robbie Lawler's, where he just can't push as hard, and he just can't keep a pace anymore, and he just lets way too much time slip away from him. He's clearly not physically as strong anymore. He can't even fight his own fight without getting exhausted. And so, like like I said, his chin never just... It never just gave way. But in some ways, I'm almost happier that it didn't because this was a more thorough, comprehensive loss. And uh, and I, I appreciated that greatly. Like... So I think to to round out this discussion, because I mean, we could we could shit on DC all day, and God knows I'd love to do that. Where do we think DC lands in the in the pantheon of MMA? Like where did where where are we leaving him? I guess we should probably talk about Miocic too, considering he won. But I guess DC's <laughs> the one who retired. So what do we got? Uh, I say sub twenty. I think I had him sub twenty the first time, honestly, and this uh, this loss obviously didn't help. Uh, I think. As I mentioned before, the fact that his best win was avenged twice over kind of hurts him a lot, you know, because if you look at a bunch of other guys, they tend to like the very best of the best. And DC doesn't really deserve that comparison, but people make it. So if you look at the very best of the best, it's not always just a complete wash the way DC against Stipe was in the third fight, arguably against Jones both times. Like you don't tend to see guys get outclassed that way without changing at all. Like if Max Holloway just came out in the second fight against Volkanovski and got completely washed, I think I'd be significantly less confident about how I feel about him, but he came out and adapted and DC just doesn't really do that. So I think I had him sub 20 the first time. I'm going to have him sub 20 this time again. I think a lot of what DC did against guys like Rumble and Gus, as you mentioned, the messiness of those wins is another one. I think both of those wins are like solid ones for light heavyweight, but as we've said, ad nauseum, like pretty much everywhere, I think they suffer when comparing it to a lot of other guys at uh, different divisions. So it's, I mentioned on Twitter, I think Cormier's biggest contribution to anyone's legacy is keeping Anthony Johnson from facing John Jones at any point. He, he beat Anthony Johnson twice and Johnson was probably going to win or lose, destroy the mystique of the unbeatable John Jones at some point where Cormier was just never in position to do anything but feed into it. So Cormier is sub 20, but he's a reason why John Jones is such a uh, force in Greatest of all time discussions at this point. I think DC will forever be the best example in MMA of uh, a great fighter, but not deserving of what I would say all time great status. What he did was impressive, but his limitations and how those limitations were shown up when he fought guys that I would put in my top 20, that clearly defines somebody who's not a top 20 fighter. Somebody who could leverage tremendous natural advantages but couldn't sustain them against the best fighters in the world because when you fight the best fighters in the world the absolute best fighters and no matter where you think john jones should be in your top 20 he's in everybody's top 20 i think the ochich probably is in everybody's top 20 at this point he fought them and he lost and the way he lost kind of proves a lot of what you guys talk about in your articles and your chats and so on so yeah i would say dc is um People are going to get mad at me for saying this, but I think he's the perfect example of a gatekeeper to true all-time great status Ooh. and the ways in which he failed <laughs> and in which he didn't adapt and learn set a perfect bar for comparison. Because every, whenever every, everyone thinks about DC now, they're not going to think about his hard working. They're not going to think about his lift lift yourself up persona. They're going to think about the fact that he lost to a, you know, to a, a pregnant uh, car crashing woman drug cheat and a big boy from you know, a big boy from the city with two hands and a dream. Man, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can top that. Damn it. Yeah. I want to, I want to say something. And this was something that had been on my mind and I meant to say it during my, I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't have either of you guys on my DC hate cast. Did I, I can't remember. I don't think I did. Nope. Um, who, I, it was, I had Connor and Ryan and you had Sandro. Sandro. Yeah, that's right. But I meant to say this when I wrapped up the hate cast, which ended up being really fun. I did not walk away with many lessons about DC that I didn't already know. Surprise. But I wanted to say, take a look at if I if I had done that series on a fighter who wasn't DC. Let's say I did a hate cast on, like, Johnny Hendricks. And I had watched all of Johnny Hendricks' fights, 
and I looked at all the things that Johnny Hendricks didn't do as well as a fighter, and I had compared him to a bunch of fighters who I think do the Johnny Hendricks things and do it better than him. If I had done that, I would have never once used DC as an example of of anything in MMA because everything DC does is better <laughs> represented elsewhere. People wonder what my what is my problem with DC? That's my problem with DC. My problem with him is that he he doesn't there isn't anything in his game that I think is is particularly great nor do I think the like the context of the pieces of his game is great in concert as well. I've talked about many times about how GSP is a fighter who's greater than the sum of his parts. That That is not the case for DC. I would never use DC as an example of a fighter for upcoming fighters to look at, to build their games after. I would never point to DC as an example of a fighter who I think has a replicable style for many other people. I don't think there's a lot of technical nuance or things to learn from DC's game that I would want other fighters to to like hold on to to build off of if that makes sense so in asking where does dc land in the pantheon of mma i am i'm particularly critical i have to be like i can admit i am quite vitriolic when it comes to dc on twitter I am very critical of him. I have been very critical of DC's career for a very long time, and I probably will be for the foreseeable future. I can admit DC is not some kind of disastrous failure as a fighter. Far from it. You know, you, he's, as Hack said, he's accomplished a great deal in his career, and I can, I can respect that for what it is. But if you really ask me to take a look at him, in my opinion, there really isn't much great about him either. Lastly is Stipe Miocic. What do we think? Do we think anything different of Stipe now than we did? Because I I think that this this win in particular did a good amount to boost him up. Having you know winning a trilogy like this, especially get after getting knocked out in the first fight in the first round, I think it's a pretty big deal. What are we? What are you guys thinking? Yeah, I mean I think it's kind of like Groundhog Day for Stipe at this point because if you go back like a year and a half. You had, uh, beginning of 2018, he had Ngannou uh, to look forward to, if that's the thing that you do, and uh, Cormier, the light heavyweight champion, coming up. Uh, and then now you have Ngannou, the scary guy in front of him, who he probably isn't looking forward to. And you have John Jones, who has recently said he's vacating the light heavyweight belt and going to move up. So Stipe is kind of like, it's, it's natural for heavyweight that things don't happen, and even the things that happen get undone pretty quickly. But Stipe is in a position where, I'm not sure how much heavyweight is going to help him boost his legacy aside from John Jones. And I'm not sure how much we rate John Jones as a win at heavyweight at this point in his career. All that said, I think Stipe, you could easily say he's top 20 and you could easily say that he's the greatest heavyweight of all time, even including Fedor Emelianenko. Because one thing that uh, you mentioned in the article, Danny, and that I mentioned earlier is that the way that Stipe has won has been very impressive in a heavyweight context where fighters just aren't that smart. He's beaten a bunch of different fighters in slightly different ways, and that that's something that the heavyweights just don't tend to do. They don't tend to be smart or have the skill set to facilitate intelligence, and Stipe has those, and he has a very formidable resume for a heavyweight. It's just I have a lesser version of the critique that I have for Cormier in that he's not at a division that facilitates true greatness in a way that like featherweight or bantamweight or lightweight does. He's done the best that he can. I'm just not sure how much is possible. I think maybe to contrast him a little with DC, if DC is the cautionary tale for heavyweights, this is how you can be less than the sum of your attributes. Miocic is the opposite. He's greater than the sum of his individual physical attributes. Um, I really need to sit down and kind of hash out where I put fighters, but yeah, I think top 20. This fight, where does this fight move him on the scale for me? I think from a technical perspective or a peak perspective or anything like that, it doesn't change anything. But I would also probably caution anyone that was too critical of his technical game and so on in these fights. He's 38. Like, you know, you could be the best athlete and you could be the best fighter in the history of the sport. And you're not probably going to show much new at 38. And people that can are extraordinary fighters, you know, who we, we are B-hop, if, if, you, if you know your boxing. Um I would also say 
from a non-technical perspective, I think this is the finest win of his career. He looked across the octagon from another fighter who's, you know, probably, I think 100% of people would have him in their top 40. Most would probably have him in their top 30. He looked across the uh, octagon from somebody at that level. And you could even perhaps argue that DC's theoretical peak might be a little higher in heavyweight than light heavyweight. I'd buy that. And he said, I'm going to beat you in your wheelhouse. And he did it. And that is impressive and I would even say legacy-defining, not just because he did it in the other guy's wheelhouse, but because, as both of you have made very fairly, that's not how Miocic won his fights. He's won his fights by being 1% or 2% smarter than everybody else in heavyweight. And that might not seem like a lot, but his heavyweight resume, uh, a division where people usually get knocked the fuck out, it says it says volumes. I think when you have those two things, when you step into another top-level fighter's area of comfort and you beat them, and you do it not because you have to, but almost because you can, that is a tremendous achievement from a legacy perspective. It is very fairly critiquable from a technical perspective. But I mean, to to give a shout out to Tuman, to travel into your opponent's lands, to burn his houses and steal his wives, is that not the greatest pleasure of all? <laughs> Genghis Khan uh, is cancelled, so you can't say that right. anymore. Our friend Tuman always has – he's always got something for it. Yeah, I I like that a lot. I think top 20 is probably fair. I think I had Stipe on the lower end of the top 20. I mean, I'm probably – again, it, with the, as Sperm said, given what he's working with at heavyweight, that's probably where he's going to stay. I think this was more – it was it was a very satisfying win for me because – I always knew that Stipe was a better fighter than DC, and I had to I had to deal with the backlash after the first fight, and to see it, you know, over it it was it was worth it in the long run. If if you know if say we wind back the clock a bit, if Stipe had just knocked Cormier out at UFC 226 like most people expected him to, it would have been impressive, but I don't think it would have would have really shown what made Stipe a great fighter and a great champion the way that the latter two fights in this series did. I agree. He's he's 38. When he was rematching DC at 37, I was skeptical. And here he is winning him winning two fights over him by the time he's 38. That is unquestionably a a great legacy cementing series that he has under his belt. Like he has every reason to be proud. I realize it's heavyweight and there's a lot of times that we can cut corners on analysis. Um, But the one, there was one point that I made in the article I wrote with Kyle that I want to highlight is that when you look back at the fighters that Stipe has beaten and you have Daniel Cormier twice, Francis Ngannou, Junior Dos Santos, Alistair Overeem, Fabricio Verdum, even like Andre Arlovsky and Mark Hunt. I don't, no, if there's many heavyweights in the sports history that could have beaten all of these men successively and beaten them all the way that Stipe did. And for that alone, I think I probably have him as the greatest heavyweight of all time. Whatever happens next, I think Stipe has earned earned everybody's respect in a, in a sport and from an organization that seemed really, really, really hesitant to lend it to him. And that makes me happy. I think he has every reason to be to be proud and congratulations, Stephen Miocic. Okay, there wasn't a whole lot more left on this card that I think uh, we really have to go into detail about, but we should touch on one of the one of the controversial endings to one of the fights, which was uh, Sean O'Malley versus Cheeto Vera. If I remember correctly, I think all of us picked Cheeto to win that fight. Uh, we thought it was going to be he was going to be too grimy, uh, a little too tough, and willing to push a pace against O'Malley. Um, and that was true. Uh, but it also looked like O'Malley sustained a kind of a strange low percentage. Well, maybe it's not low percentage. Uh, injury to his foot. And Cheeto quickly disposed of him. Uh, Hacks, I didn't get your take on this. What do you? What was your read on that fight? I mean, firstly... <sighs> I, I don't think it gives us a tremendous amount of where the two fighters stand in terms of potential greatness or ceiling or so on, simply because we would, we need more data. But my thought process was, um, and this is something I, I hinted at a little in the chat, 
it's what I call the economy of time. When you when you spend your rounds, sorry, when you have a five minute round, how, how do you spend it? What do you what do you accomplish with it? And in those first two minutes of that fight, uh, Cheeto, who I really want to start calling the Cheeto because the idea of just kind of representing him with a mass market American consumer food is really funny to me, but I'll just keep that to myself. Um, by two minutes, Cheeto had developed a measure of comfort. He wasn't put off by O'Malley's feints. He was getting outlanded from what I remember, but he had, you know, he had some of his own kicks going. So he understood that, you know, he had a weapon that he could, he could needle back at O'Malley and kind of have a, you don't get this for free. And I think if you've got a protractor and you like did trace, traced the path of each man across the ring, it felt like Cheeto was slowly, slowly, slowly cutting off the ring bit by bit, small edge by small edge on O'Malley. And he did all that in two minutes against a fighter who we haven't really seen tremendous knockout power from unless a guy is kind of running into his needling, you know, into his counters from his needling strikes. And in a fight where Cheeto usually comes on slowly in the first round and then, you know, delivers in the second and third. If you're a slow starting fighter like Cheeto and you're a fighter who, as some of you have critiqued, maybe um, struggles perhaps with really using the first round productively if in the first two fucking minutes you have uh, the ring craft figured out how to beat this guy, you're needling him and not getting totally blown out in range strikes, and you're not biting on his feints, I mean, that to me just screams, oh, Cheeto's going to kill him in round three. And we didn't get to round three for you know various reasons, but I just kind of looked at that and I was like, yeah, no, Cheeto looked good. Uh, I'm not going to say O'Malley looked figured out, but it – it looked like it was rapidly developing into the sort of fight that Cheeto wanted, and I think O'Malley was going to have a really rough time. I think beyond that, I can't say. Yeah. Uh, Danny, when you said a controversial ending, I thought you meant the fence ambushing JDS from behind again because it's been too many times and it should really stop doing that. Oh, yeah, that but, felt like a fluke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I agree with how the fight was going for uh, for Cheeto. I think – the way that uh, our friend Simon put it is probably the right way. I don't think that this fight ended with, like, Cheeto attacking some mystical pressure point. Like, there are people saying, like, oh, he aimed at the peroneal nerve that gave Sean O'Malley the foot drop. And I think that's kind of <laughs> no, just not did. it. No, they, that's really? not it at all. People really he saying threw a that. light kick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've seen it. It's killing me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is not, uh, I don't know, what's one of those, uh, it's, this is not George Dillman's DVDs or whatever. Cheeto threw a leg kick and it was a good one and it landed. And I think the thing to take away from it is that Sean O'Malley, he either has a recurring foot injury or he needs to stop cutting as much weight uh, because he's a, he's a massive 135er. But saying that, I don't think that it was a fight that O'Malley was bound to win because it's just the dynamic of the fight, right? O'Malley was playing an attrition game and I don't think an attrition game was the way he was going to beat Chito Vera, who was both A, incredibly durable. Uh, he got through a fight with John Lineker. He's A, incredibly durable, and B, just the kind to completely out cardio Sean O'Malley starting round two and just flurry on him and just wear on Sean O'Malley, who has gassed out from his own pace before. He did it with Terry and Ware. So I think it wasn't a fight that O'Malley was bound to win, but it was a fight that didn't say much. Like the comparison I want to make is like Korean Zombie versus Moicano. It was a legitimate win. But I don't really know if it told us anything at all. Yeah, I feel like the real takeaway for me is I'm kind of bummed for Sean O'Malley. Like, I don't even really consider myself a huge fan or, you know, a big believer in Sean O'Malley. But, like, <clears throat> he looked like he could be fun. The, there, I, Sean O'Malley was getting a lot of hype. I mean, the Conor McGregor comparisons were obviously very premature. I think we can all agree on that. He did not demonstrate the same like offensive depth or craft, uh, even to warrant like a round one pick over Cheeto. I was like, I think that's asking too much. But I was hoping that we were actually going to get some some answers in this fight. Uh, I mean, Ch Cheeto starting fast and basically having the reads and having O'Malley figured out early was incredibly impressive in its own right. But I I I don't really like seeing O'Malley take that same injury again. Like, I really, I'm honest, I really don't. Like, he's he's really young in his career. I hope he gets a chance to figure it out because I, like I said, he's he's fun. He's a fun prospect. I don't know, like, what his ceiling is, but he looked like he could be a lot of fun in the top 15. Like, you know, you could put him up against someone like Rob Font 
Yeah, that's that's a good fight. Like or Corey Sanhag, I don't care. Like there's a lot of fun fights for him there. But I don't. I didn't think this was a a, a great look. But I I, th- I think I'm with Hacks. You sort of have to wait and see. Uh, wait and see how it shakes out in his career before I make any concrete concrete evaluation on what his ceiling is. Was there anything else? I mean, you brought up JDS versus uh, Rosenstrike, where JDS is back hit the fence, and it looked like he was like, wait, what? Who put that there? Is this cage craft? Is this like ring craft regressing? It might. I don't know. It's it, like Small that was cage. such a that was so weird. It did ambush him. Oh yeah, uh huh, yeah. It was a small. If they were in a full size cage, yeah, he's he would have had that figured out, no doubt. I don't have a lot else. I figured we were going to spend most of the day talking about DC Steep Bay. We did, and then really O'Malley Cheetah was the only other thing on on my mind. Do you guys have anything last you want to bring up? Just yet more evidence that Rosenstreak is perfectly happy going so slowly that he never has a chance to do anything dumb, which I think is a, for I the most part, a pretty smart heavyweight strategy. I mean, if you fight with a jab and a low kick and you just kind of chill and, you know, you make a convincing argument that you didn't get smashed in the first round, then you've got a bunch of other rounds to figure out how to be less dumb and finish the fight. And it works, doesn't it? It really, it really does work for Rose Strick. And he, you know, as the two of you mentioned in the last, uh, the last episode, he does a lot of things that are actually pretty good for heavyweight. So everyone else was sad for JDS in that one, but I was kind of watching that like, yeah, yeah, no, no, you, you get him, Rose I mean, you're not really going and getting him, but you slowly inch across the, across the octagon and knock him the fuck out. Um, <laughs> I love JDS. I do. I do. But I just can't be emotionally invested in his fights anymore. He just refuses to fix. Okay. I'm not going to say refuses, but he's incapable of fixing such fundamental flaws. I just want him to quit because I think he's taking unnecessary brain damage at this point. And I'm deeply sick and tired of an MMA culture. That's like, yeah, man, you you got one more good fight in you. It's like, yes, he's got one more good fight in him where he will somehow magically fix a flaw that's been there for like how many years in his career now? It's not going to happen, guys. I'm sorry. Pack it in. Move on. Stop standing JDS so that he'll finally quit and he'll take less brain damage. It's not funny at this point. Yeah, stop putting him in main event slots. Stop putting him in on the main card. Yeah, that's that's the kind of thing. Is like JDS actually has some. He actually has some name power, so the UFC is kind of milking him for all they can for their. You know, I mean, fuck me. That's like three. I guess you can call them prospects that he's heavyweight prospects that he's fought in a row he fought in ganu blades and rosenstrike and now all three of them have gotten some kind of rub from his name uh at the expense of some of jds's brain cells i'm with you i don't like it serum do you have anything coming out this week no <laughs> shit is there anything to talk about this week um, well i meant in terms of, are you writing anything do you have anything coming out yeah i don't i don't think so i mean we're probably not this month the staff picks I'm not completely lazy, oh, just geez. mostly. Lazy son of a bitch. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, you did the yeah. staff picks. Cool. I mean, we're Good not job. even doing that this week. Are How we... do you guys feel about Pedro Munoz killing Frankie Edgar? Yeah, I mean, do we, are we even doing a staff picks? I'm going to guess probably not. There's nothing to talk about. No. The co-main event is OSP at light heavyweight, where he does not yeah. have okay. the yeah. scintillating dumper. So that's a no on articles, <laughs> is what I'm <laughs> That's hearing. a long way of saying that. Yep. Hacks? Do you have any article? <laughs> no, although I, I don't mind watching uh, Edgar get knocked out sometimes because of certain, uh, shall we say, autocratic friends he has. You know, I, I'm never going to feel sad. If if somebody has to get knocked out, I'm backing the guy getting knocked out that backs the autocrat. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I co-signed uh, that. I'm with is, it. Is Pedro a Bolsonaro guy? Because I don't know how to feel about this if so. Are we really going to get into a Kadi Rob versus Bolsonaro debate? We might have to. No, oh, we don't okay. have to. Let's right. not. No. Well, then um, we can hope for a simultaneous double knockout. It's fine. It's fine. Just, you know. <laughs> it is fine. It's totally fine. I, I have yes, yes, I have articles coming out. In fact, I had one come out yesterday. I wrote an, a piece with the CEO of the fight site, uh, Kyle McLaughlin, and I did a back and forth roundtable on. Fedor Emelianenko versus Stipe Miocic, who is the greatest heavyweight of all time. I backed Stipe. Uh, he backed Fedor. No surprises there, as he's like 45 years old, and he's he saw he saw Fedor when he was coming up the ranks. Like you don't you don't know it like like I know it. You weren't there, man. The Vietnam veteran of uh, I'm of being MMA. Bullied fans. by proxy here. 
<laughs> this is, I, I mean, this is why I had to drag Axe into it. Um, and then I, I also have a. It, it was a. It started as like a. I mean, fuck. It's a. It's a meta game piece, kind of. It's probably going to be the last one that I do for a, a good long time, just because I'm kind of meta gamed out. I'm kind of exhausted. But I did a case study on Will Brooks, uh, and where most people can remember his meteoric rise through Bellator and his catastrophic downfall in the UFC. <clears throat> I finally went back and did a huge analysis piece on his entire career, and I really think I figured it out this time. I actually think I've kind of pinned down Will Brooks as a fighter and figured out exactly what went wrong. So I'm very proud of that. I'm proud of the piece. I don't know if it's running this week. I'll have to harass Ed and Kyle and, and make them uh, put it up, because I'd like, I'd like to run it, but I know we're kind of in the aftermath of a pretty... Pretty significant, like, or, you know, I mean, a pay-per-view that had some, like, goat ramifications. And anytime you have a pay-per-view like that, you kind of want to get some clicks on it. So I understand. But that should be coming out soon. For all of your combat sports needs, you can go to thefightsite.com. Follow Sriram on Twitter, at says. You can follow Haxorized on Twitter, at Haxorized, H-A-X-X-O-R-I-Z-E-D. I really feel like I just need to record this piece and say it over again because i've said it like 14 times um you can follow me at dmarty 77 on the fight site if you go down to the very bottom you go to hyperfly hyperfly is all your jujitsu and gi needs uh assuming you still have those in a pandemic if you go through our link on the fight site you can get a discount uh be sure to check out the fight site's twitter stay up to date with all of our interviews articles analysis discussion roundtable etc etc uh we will continue posting content and we should be back next week i don't know what it's gonna be but we uh, might it's anthony what smith is... and rackage smith rackage okay that sounds I'm... like a call for schwan <laughs> i'm excited that might be we might have to reach out to schwan on that one because he could he could probably give us some some light heavyweight insight I mean, there's um, Ricardo Lamas. Yes, yeah, Hacks is like, I'm with that. Um, oh, is that Lamas Hall? Yep. Oh, we definitely have to get get Schwan on here. Okay. <laughs> we're, okay, we're gonna try. We're gonna try, listeners. We'll we'll talk to Schwan and see if we can get him on for next week. But we have a bunch of guests that we're I'm like trying to go down the list of because we've got so many awesome people who want to join us. Thank you all again. Stay safe. And in case you forgot. Fuck Daniel Cormier.